latinos creciendo, energía positiva, felicidad y amor constante, pasión es medida. PhD psychologist John H. McCain, One Life, Many Years of Experience. Here is his path to success. Enjoy. PhD en psicología, John Howard McCain, Una Vida. Muchísimos años de experiencia. Aquí tienen su camino hacia el éxito. Disfruten. As a professional, who is Dr. John McCain? I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist who has been practicing here in the state of Arizona for approximately the past 35 years. Can you please explain what exactly clinical and forensic psychologists are? Uh, certainly. Start with the area of clinical psychology because it's the one that people are probably most familiar with. Clinical psychology is a study of the workings of the brain and human emotion. It's a study of mental illnesses and mental diseases. And most practicing psychologists are working with their clients to address problems in their lives and to help them out with the mental disorders that they're struggling with. That includes depression, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress, circumstances that basically prevent people from living healthy and, and, and happy lives. So that's the area of psychology, uh, clinical psychology that people are most familiar with. Forensic psychology is similar. In fact, most forensic psychologists are clinical psychologists, but they practice in the forensic arena, in the court of law. So forensic psychologists provide expert testimony in courtrooms about uh, different types of mental illnesses that the criminals being prosecuted may suffer with as a way of trying to explain and provide some understanding of why people do the things that they do. We also, as a matter of forensic work, do psychological evaluations to assess for mental illnesses and other problems that might help explain to the court, the judges and juries, what might be motivating, what might be causing the behavior and conduct of the criminals that they are prosecuting. What was first for you, the clinical or the forensic psychologist? My initial interest in training was in clinical psychology. That's where I went to pursue my uh, PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Maryland, specifically because I wanted to work in clinical work in the communities. But in working with uh, children and families, particularly when it started involving circumstances where children or women and uh, mothers were being abused, it led to it being involved in criminal cases where abusive men or uh, parents who were abusive to their kids were being prosecuted because these are this is criminal behavior, the abuse of women and the abuse of children. So the clinical work and developing a reputation in, in that particular area brought me into the forensic arena initially as an expert witness on uh, child abuse and domestic violence and then eventually as a psychological consultant doing evaluations with women who had been abused and, and sometimes in their defense as they were protecting themselves they protected themselves from being harmed and were being prosecuted for lethal attacks and homicides when in fact they were in self-defense and, and so that's why i started getting into forensic work where did your interest in working with community children and family started i always knew i wanted to work inside the communities not hospitals or private practice which is why the uh, program at the University of Maryland um, was uh, chosen because it was a clinical and community program, um, not one designed for people planning to go into academics or, or uh, private practice or hospitals. Um, so I knew I wanted to work in communities. After I completed my academic work, you have to have an, uh, a pre-doctoral internship before you can get your degree. So I chose the University Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona in part because my sister lived there and I thought it'd be nice to uh, be in a place where I had family. Um, so I started working at University Medical Center and the reality is that when you're an intern you're at the bottom of the totem pole um, and there's doctors and, and psychiatrists and psychologists um, and so you're in training with them but you know you sometimes only get the cases that they don't want um, and the reality was that Most of the people on that team didn't want to work with children and specifically didn't want to work with teenagers. So they gave them all to the interns. There were, there were four of us there. 
um, interns from different parts of the country. So we would get those particular cases. So I was given a, one particular young man, he's 12 years old, I still remember, his name is Jeffrey. And nobody wanted to work with him um, because Jeffrey was probably, now I can look back now and say had attention deficit disorder um, and some of the problems uh, um, that made him really rambunctious and rowdy. Um, and, and everybody knew that. I didn't, so they gave it to, to me and I, I can hear them laughing because they were thinking, well, you know, he's an intern, so he's going to have to deal with Jeffrey. Well, the bottom line is that Jeffrey and I got along great uh, because one of the things I did, um, we were on the seventh floor of the building, but it was, it was like shaped in a square with the elevator, you know, on one side. So there was no way he'd get out of the building except the elevator. So what Jeffrey um, started doing is before he came in to talk to me, he would run the whole square of the building. Um, and if he wasn't, if he wanted to run it again, he would. Um, and once he ran and he was kind of tired out, he would sit down and he would talk. And that became our ritual. I had to tell everybody to leave Jeffrey alone. Um, he's running the, around the building because I asked him to. Um, when he had a really bad day, by the way, he would run a lot. If it was a good day, he might run maybe two laps around the building and sit down and talk. But on a couple of times, when things got really difficult, he was talking about his dad, um, who had had a heart attack, which nobody knew, um, which is why he was upset and depressed. He ran around the building maybe four or five or six times um, before we'd come into the office, sit and collapse, um, and, and sit and talk. Um, and then I started getting other kids. And so all of a sudden, without any plan or intent, I became the child expert um, in the hospital, even though I was an intern. So all these kids were being sent to me, and I loved working with them because I, I love kids. Um, and that's how I became a child expert and started working with children. You became a child expert by accident, so to speak. Where did you go from there? The year at University Medical Center is required. It's a training year. You actually don't really get paid. You have to basically be able to um, have enough money saved. After the end of the year, in my training year, the hospital actually offered me um, an extension to stay on with them as what they call a postdoctoral. Um, um, in, uh, I guess um, not psychologist, but a postdoctoral um, intern. Um, and what they did was, because they knew I went into psychology because I, because I wanted to work in the community, um, the hospital had a contract with a small clinic north of town uh, called Marana. Um, and the postdoc, was, which was still a training year, but one year past training, um, was assigned to run the um, Marana um, Health Center. Um, as a psychologist there. So I agreed to stay on um, as an additional year because being first year out of school and having an appointment at a, as a professor in a hospital is, is a good thing in terms of status and future. So I thought rather than going back to California, which was my plan, um, I would go ahead and accept the postdoctoral position, um, take the position, which was just a one-year position, to run the Ramani Health Center, um, which is, was a counseling center, um, um, and a health center as well. So I worked with a, with a physician um, who worked with uh, other kinds of illnesses and, and problems and I worked as a behavioral health um, uh, professor of psychology. Um, it was me and just two students and that was my whole staff. Just me and two students from the University of Arizona. Um, and But I was now working in a community health center um, and so I was happy and stayed there for the for the entire year um, and completed my postdoc um, there at the Morani Health Center um, as a contract employer um, from University Medical Center. What was the community of Marana like when you just started working in that area of Arizona? Morana was a very small community about 20 miles north of Tucson. Um, and Tucson is a very prosperous city in Arizona. One of the two cities that are major metropolitan areas, Phoenix and Tucson. But Marana was about 20 miles north. Um, very small, tiny little clinic. But it was my first, you know, real office, separate from the medical center where I was training. So I was actually very proud of it. But the community of Marana um, had one little grocery store, um, one 7-Eleven off the freeway, um, and a couple of schools, but no real resources in terms of counseling, mental health, um, and so this little clinic 
uh, serve the elementary schools, junior high schools um, of the community, which is primarily some farming, some agriculture, um, but a lot of people just scraping by. Um, there was not a whole lot of money and resources in the community. So it became really clear that these families were very distressed and had very little help and assistance other than this tiny little clinic. Um, so I, I love that community. Um, I got to know people really well. They got to know me um, once I was there. Um, I would, you'd stop at the gas station and you know maybe the, the person who runs the gas station knew I worked with his son. And so he's waving hi and, and coming out to, to, to speak. Um, but the thing that was interesting about Marana, though, is um, as an African-American, um, there were hardly any African-Americans in the Marana community. Um, so I was a bit of a novelty. Um, and we had to get used to each other. Um, even the doctor at the clinic, when I first came in to interview, um, he had reservations about that. And we, we talked about it. But he decided after the interview that he felt um, that I would be good for this this practice, good for the clinic. Um, and he and I, his name was Dr. Bill Barish, he was a physician there, um, became very close partners. Um, and a lot of the people I saw, um, uh, Dr. Barish actually referred to me um, because we worked together. But it was a very, very distressed uh, community um, and greatly needed services, um, probably more than we could provide um, as a clinic because it was a very, very small staff, but um, the staff were dedicated, um, highly professional, and you know, I was proud to be associated with that little clinic there. According to this, this was a one-year contract. What happened next? Okay, well, what happened next, I'm pretty sure the University Medical Center probably still doesn't know to to this day, okay? Um, because it was a one-year contract, and I was being paid, um, you know, training salaries by the medical center, to work at Marana Health Center. At the end of the year, um, Dr. Barish went to the board of directors of the clinic um, and they made a proposal um, to hire me directly, which means they would break their contract with the university and I would be paid by the clinic directly. So they sat and talked to me about it um, and um, I said, um, yes, that I would agree to stay and work full time for them and become an employee of the Marana Health Center. So then they went back to the board of directors, went back to the University Medical Center, and they, they ended the contract with the university. Um, and so the university was concerned about the, uh, about the postdoctoral position that was no longer going to be available because they were thinking about trying to offer it to me a second time, but it would be at a trainee salary. Um, and I didn't feel a need to tell them. Um, of course, they found out later, um, but I took the position um, and with the as a staff psychologist, my very first full-time full psychologist position, and I ended up staying there for several years after the postdoctoral internship was scheduled to be uh, to be terminated. Latinos creciendo, energía positiva, felicidad y amor constante, pasiones medida. And now you are a staff psychologist. As your first full-time position, I really would like to know about the problems that you found in that clinic. Well, the first obvious problem, um, as I mentioned before, this was an economically distressed community, which means people didn't have a whole lot of money laying around to pay for very expensive um, clinic services, whether they were medical services or behavioral health and counseling services. So the first challenge was finding funding um, that would pay for the services um, that would allow the clients to not be burdened by um, additional costs in addition to the other problems they were having. So I had to meet with the, the city of Tucson. Um, they had grants to provide services to small rural communities. Um, and the first challenge was getting them to approve and renew the grant that was there, which was very small, and convincing them to expand it, which they weren't sure could happen because the, the clinic was um, uh, so small and didn't have a whole lot of resources. Um, and again, keeping in mind, I was the only actually full-time staff position in counseling. The others were interns who were in the master's program at the University of Arizona. So I had to convince the city of Tucson that if they expanded the contract, it wouldn't be money that was wasted, that we would 
um, ensure that that money was well spent um, and not just sitting there and not being utilized which means we had to ensure that we had an increased volume and number of people who were seen um, with myself as the only staff person and three interns so they agreed and renewed the contract, increased the, the funding. So the City of Tucson's Rural Services contract actually paid the clinic um, money for each visit that came in. So the people coming in who couldn't afford it wouldn't be burdened with the, the cost of services being provided. But that was the first challenge, is having the funding come in to be able to make sure that the clinic was financially viable and, and could pay for itself. Um, because the clinic now was paying my salary. So they had to generate uh, enough money to be able to do so. So that was the first challenge. Talking about that specific clinic, where do you consider it was the biggest accomplishment you had at that time period? The biggest accomplishment was being able to be successful at expanding services and seeing more people by training the interns from the university um, uh, to work not as my assistants, but as, as therapists and counselors um, who were treated respectfully as, as professionals, uh, not as students. Um, the other accomplishment related to that is the interns from the University of Arizona that worked my clinic, their professional growth was, was, according to the university, astounding. So when they went back to their seminars at the university, uh, people were really surprised and, and impressed with what these interns were learning, but the reason was I didn't treat them as students. I taught them as young professionals, and my goal was to develop them in terms of their skill and confidence. The end result of that is the placements for training um, in the University of Arizona um, became, uh, well, I guess the students there um, saw our training site as, as a priority, as, a, as the first, and so there was competition, so I ended up getting the best students. The end result is that the services were really good um, and the, the, the trainees were excellent and dedicated. They worked hard, were open-minded, and it allowed the clinic to grow to the point where we were able to expand to a, an additional position and, and also um, hire, um, instead of uh, two interns, three and four interns um, to continue to expand the service. So the biggest accomplishment was, was making sure that the clinic generated enough money by the grants that the uh, service could continue. And the other was having an excellent reputation for training and getting basically what I consider the best interns out of the University of Arizona um, to train and to work. Those are two accomplishments I'm very proud of. What was your next professional step after Marana? Well, after Marana, it was really a, a combination of steps. Um, as the reputation of this small little clinic grew with the help of these great trainees and interns I had, um, I got a request from another small clinic east of Tucson, um, as opposed to north, about the same distance, 20 miles away, called Catalina Health Services. They had never had counseling services of any kind, extreme, much smaller than even Marana, just a couple of rooms in a clinic on the top of this little hill, I remember. So I agreed to go out there uh, once a week um, and provide counseling services for this even smaller community. Um, during that time, um, I received a call from uh, the executive director of uh, La Frontera Center, um, which was the largest community mental health center in the state of Arizona. Um, so I was curious and I thought, well, it give me a chance maybe to um, learn about uh, what they're doing and um, because the executive director at that time, and her name um, escapes me, um, which is unfortunate because she was a wonderful woman um, and a pioneer that worked in the Clinton administration um, during that time in, in mental health services. Um, so I met with her and sat and talked with her and very, very informal conversation about what we were doing in the clinic and and some of the things that she'd heard we were doing. And I was thinking at the end of the conversation, we'd be you know, ready to go. Um, and she looked at me and sat back and smiled and said, so are you coming on board with us? I, I had no idea this was a job interview. It was just a conversation. So I was kind of stunned and excited because she was extremely well known and, um, and, and um, I guess um, uh, respected in the community. She founded this little clinic 
um, at, Mara at La Frontera out of two trailers and grew it to the largest community mental health center in, in the state of Arizona. Um, so, but then my excitement kind of took a back seat and I thought, uh, I'm not really ready to leave Marana. Marana is like a little, little baby that I, that I grew. So I told her, here's the deal. Okay. I will take your position as a clinical director here at La Frontera under the condition that I work there only three days a week. That way I can still work, um, two days at Marana and alternate one day a week at Catalina. Um, so she smiled and sat back and, and said, I, I kind of figured that was the case, so we already worked that out. Um, and so I became the clinical director of La Frontera Center um, in Tucson, while I was continuing to be the clinical director of the two small clinics outside of Tucson, of the Marani Health Center and the Catalina Health Services. Um, and I was really happy because my whole goal um, was to work in community mental health and now I was doing that in multiple sites uh, in communities in Tucson. So I was I was feeling really good about where I was professionally at that point um, and stayed there for the next several years. How did you do that? Because there were distance between one place and the other. I am just wondering how much you loved what you were doing because it looks kind of difficult to me. Well, first of all, when you love doing something, nothing's difficult. Um, so, and, and, uh, and by the way, remember, I'm originally from California. Californians drive, okay? Um, so it was half an hour drive um, from, you know, my house to the North Clinic in Marana. It was a half an hour drive, almost exactly the same, from my house to the East Clinic in Catalina. Um, but the important thing is... I loved what I was doing because these were communities that desperately needed help, uh, had no help, and like most people who are desperate for help and, 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 and receive it, extremely grateful, extremely appreciative. Um, and so it's rewarding in and of itself. The other is that by opening the Catalina Clinic, it gave me the opportunity to uh, bring on additional interns. So at this time, now I'm, I'm, I'm training. Um, you know, three to five interns, depending on how many uh, applied that year. So I'm doing two things that I love. One is working with people who, who desperately need and appreciate help. And the other is training young minds um, to grow beyond the kind of academic approaches uh, to counseling and psychology and understand you're working with human beings and you have to be a human being with them. Um, so I, I was... I. It may sound difficult, but uh, that was one of the, my favorite times of, 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 of life as a, as a professional when I was running those three clinics. According to my notes, at some point you were as director of training in La Frontera Center, but you were also working in Carolina and Marana. There you were helping people in need and training students from the University of Arizona. What kind of opportunities did you find in this field? Actually, in, in looking back, uh, the opportunities that presented themselves really um, put me on, to some degree, the path that, that I'm on today, um, because they were also unanticipated. Um, the first thing is, once I became the The, the clinical director and director of training at La Frontera Center, um, they had a full training program for um, people pursuing their, their PhDs, as I was when I first came to, to Tucson. So there was training, three spots for um, doctoral um, uh, trainings. Um, they had spots for um, masters in social work trainees as well. And as the reputation of La Frontera, La Frontera grew in terms of its training site, we had um, people from Arizona State University uh, driving down to Tucson, 100 miles away, to be trainees in the La Frontera Center. And part of our, our it became a training consortium. Um, so now I had three to four trainees from the University of Arizona um, at La Frontera three to four trainees from Arizona State University using their master's social work program. I continue to have my trainees at Catalina and Ronnie Health Center. So 
at that point, I had, um, you know, some place in the neighborhood of, of 15 trainees. Um, we sat in, in group discussions, training sessions, and so I decided to start what I call the didactic seminar, just for the trainees to sharpen their, their clinical skills and knowledge. Well, the staff started attending, requested to attend the seminar. Um, and so they got approval to attend the seminars originally for trainees. And then what occurred is other agencies started requesting to come in to sit in our training seminars. So now we were doing training seminars weekly, not only for the interns and for the staff at La Frontera, but from various agencies that came in and wanted to participate in training sessions um, at uh, La Frontera. Um, that ended up leading to a training consortium uh, with University Med Medical Center, um, the VA hospital, um, a, a, a Palo Verde um, inpatient facility in Tucson, uh, behavioral health. And we did training uh, circuits. I went out to the VA and did training, went out to um, um, the Palo Verde uh, Residential Center to do training, um, and uh, the U of A Counseling Center to do training. And so I became more of a clinical trainer than an actual practitioner, although I continued to see people. Uh, largely, um, again, I started getting more and more referrals for teenage youth because the reputation from University Medical Center as an expert in, in child and adolescence still persisted. So they, they sent people uh, to us um, for our skills in working with teenagers. And I did train the staff and, and some of the techniques and approaches to working with high-risk teens. Um, now, that became another opportunity that I was unaware of at the time um, because at that point, a number of the kids in the juvenile justice system were just seen as young criminals and they weren't given uh, mental health services. Um, so I became a very vocal critic of the Department of Juvenile Corrections uh, because of their failure to understand these kids. And I remember doing a public seminar called the Juvenile Injustice System. Um, and I talked about the fact that these kids came from families that were distressed, parents that were distressed, um, and as a result of their desperation got involved in behavior that some people called criminal and I, I call survival. And I'm not justifying criminal conduct, okay, and I still don't. But people in desperate situations do desperate things. Um, and so I provided a, a fairly lengthy um, public lecture on what I call the juvenile injustice system. and and then returned to my work. Um, that particular s seminar ended up being a piece of another um, of my professional journey uh, years later, but I imagine we'll get to that later. So the opportunity was training and public information and education, um, and that was really exciting, along with, again, preparing uh, young minds to work in this very challenging, but for me, very rewarding field. And I think because I, I love this field, working with teens and communities and, and individuals that maybe aren't so popular to work with, that love of work transferred over in my training and the trainee saw the enthusiasm and saw the passion uh, that I brought to my work and my interest in my work and that's what I think made those training seminars exciting and stimulating for everybody including me. Latinos creciendo, energía positiva. From one little clinic in Marana, expanding into different clinics, I know that you are very good anticipating. And now, listening to you in this interview, I know that you are following a path. Were you conscious at some point about the big picture in this story of success? I can say initially, no, but this is where I started to learn the importance of anticipation. You know, I, this is where I first started to learn that being good at anything, you have to be able to respond to what's going on. But excellence requires you to know what's going to happen, to anticipate what's going to happen, and then act accordingly. So at this point, I became more aware of the bigger picture. Um, and this is because not only was I running um, programs, clinical programs and, and training programs for individuals and 
community mental health centers, which are primarily low income, as I mentioned before, grant funded uh, for people that, that may not be able to afford services otherwise. As a result of continuing to be the, the expert on children, um, that grew. And I started getting contacted from um, places like Desert Hills Hospital, um, places like Tucson Psychiatric Institute, um, uh, places that were actually competitors with each other, but they didn't have people that were expert uh, in working with teens. So they actually hired me to come in, each of these places, um, and a couple of others too, um, to come in and run teen discussion groups for their inpatient programs. Now, these are programs that cost people anywhere from $400 to $600 per day to be in. So these are families that have excellent insurance and a lot of personal money, as opposed to the kids and families that were just barely making it and could only participate or receive services if it was funded and paid for by grants from state, um, federal, or local um, agencies. So I saw something that was very important that started putting the big picture together for me. And that is that the kids coming from these different worlds, high income, predominantly uh, white families, um, versus lower income kids from South Phoenix, uh, South Tucson actually, South Phoenix becomes later, but South Tucson, where the La Frontera Center was purposely um, placed, they were kids doing the same thing. And in the, in the public seminar that I mentioned on the juvenile injustice system, I was asked by a member of the audience, what's the difference between the kids at Tucson Psychiatric Institute, who are in these residential programs paying $500 a day, and the kids uh, that can't afford residential treatment center um, and are department of, or, or at the community mental health center? And I said the difference is the kids in the community mental health centers get caught and they get go and they get put into the Department of Juvenile Corrections instead of residential treatment. Um, and the only difference is they got caught. Because what I can tell you is working in both of these worlds, um, the high price residential treatment world of, you know, uh, these facilities like Tucson Psychiatric and Sonora Desert Hospital and Desert uh, View, those kids either didn't get caught or their parents had the wherewithal and resources to put them in residential as an alternative to Department of Juvenile Corrections. So I started seeing the big picture that there was truly injustice in terms of teenage kids and whether they were being locked up and sent to Juvenile Corrections versus placed in high-priced, um, very expensive residential treatment programs. So that's when I started first seeing there's a bigger picture here. And if we're gonna be effective in making changes, you can't just respond and react to things going around you. You have to anticipate and be prepared. So this is the first time I can honestly say that I started cultivating a vision of where things were going and making a decision, not about what opportunities I could accept, but what opportunities I would create. And uh, what did you do? What I did was I started creating opportunities. This is where I first started getting involved with the area of domestic violence. Um, because again, stressful families, um, unfortunately have conflicts that occur. And that includes uh, children who are being mistreated um, and women who are being mistreated by their partners. So um, I joined the Board of Directors um, for the Tucson Women's Tucson Centers for Women and Children, which is a uh, well-known um, uh, organization that deals with uh, domestic violence, um, and as a result of that, um, was able to win credibility, um, which was no easy feat as a male professional in the domestic violence community, where I knew where all the shelters were for women, and went in and trained and taught. Um, which was a very unusual thing at that point for uh, a male professional to not only know the locations of women's shelters, but to be invited to come in and speak to the residents there about 
of hope and future possibilities. Um, so I was given the opportunity to do a public lecture. And originally it was scheduled to be, you know, at a, a you know, mental health center, audience of maybe 50, 100 people. Um, and what I did instead was I contacted um, people that were part of the Tucson Women Centers for Women and Children, and they sponsored and expanded and promoted it. And it ended up being a large lecture of over 800 people at the Tucson, Tucson Convention Center, um, where I had a, ch a chance to speak to people all over Arizona and people from outside the state of Arizona about the concerns about domestic violence, uh, teen violence and juvenile violence, um, and really critique um, current practices that I don't think really prioritize um, the people in need but really prioritize, um, to, I guess to be honest with you, um, financial gain and exploiting the problem, okay? By, I, I, I suppose by um, sometimes being involved in things that were semi-fraudulent semi in terms of billing practices. And one of the organizations, which I won't mention, ended up going out of business because they were charged with fraud. And this was a well-known, national organization that people will know from their um, promotional spots on TV um, and um, they were involved in fraud fraudulent uh, claims and, and billing practices exploiting a problem um, so it was uh, an opportunity to get in front of things and say here's a problem you're not seeing and something needs to be done about this um, the next step in this kind of journey was another phone call from the governor's office of the state of Arizona. Now remember I had done that presentation for the legislature um, on the um, juvenile injustice system. Um, I got invited after the, actually after the lecture in Tucson to do that presentation for legislature actually. Um, and I did that lecture to the legislature. Now keep in mind the Department of Juvenile Corrections is a state agency. So I was talking to the legislatures who set up, funded, paid for, um, and oversaw the Department of Juvenile Corrections and saying, this agency is abusive, um, it does not provide services, and it disproportionately captures uh, black and brown and white, poor income kids who can't afford high quality services because they don't have insurance plans or personal resources and funds to do it and there was the injustice that kids should not go to a treatment center um, instead of juvenile corrections based solely on the capacity of their parents to pay for clinical services um, so i was very clear about what i was doing at that point in terms of putting a bullseye and a target uh, on the department of juvenile corrections who I knew from personal experience in working with kids that those kids were being abused, misused, and neglected by a state agency, and that was not okay. So I did the presentation. Um, it was very quiet at the end. There was polite applause, um, and I thought, okay, now they know the truth. Let's see if they do anything with it. Um, and that resulted in the phone call from the governor's office the state of Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections got sued. Uh, it was a class action suit. It alleged that kids were in fact being abused, handcuffed to fences during the summer heat. Um, they were not in education in school, which is a violation of the state's um, rules that you have to be in education. You have to be in school if you're 16 and under. And the Department of Juvenile Corrections was in violation of their own rules in terms of allowing kids who were not of age to not be educated. Um, and so there were additional aspects of the lawsuit, including the kids were not receiving treatment services that they were supposed to be receiving. And so the state of Arizona got sued. Um, professionals from the state of Texas, John Arredondo and David Kokoris, were brought in to be the director and co-directors of the Department of Juvenile Corrections. Okay, um, I got a call asking if I'd be willing to accept the position with the Department of Juvenile Corrections as the clinical director overseeing um, specialized treatment programs. 
And that ended up um, put me in a position of making a very, very tough decision. Because unlike uh, the situation in La Frontera, I couldn't say, well, I'll do this if I can continue to do this. I would have to relocate to Phoenix, leave my home in Tucson, and end my practice in La Frontera, Catalina, and Verona. So after a great deal of soul searching, I decided that it was time for me to leave. But here's the rule about anticipation that once I knew I was going to leave, I didn't announce it right away. I started making some phone calls. One of them was to a former trainee of mine, one of my favorite all-time and most talented trainees, by the way, Sherry Shapiro, who was at the, the clinic in Murano with me. She stayed not only more than one year, she stayed for three years and did training with me and knew what we do inside and out. And she was a highly skilled and talented clinician. Well, she went away, got her PhD, and was certified. So I called her and said, you know, there's a position open, <laughs> coming open, and it's at the Morana Health Center. She applied for the position, got the job, and she ended up running the clinic at Morana um, after I left. At La Frontera, there was a psychologist that worked with me. Um, her name was Norma Gray. Okay? Um, she was also someone that had a high confidence in. She was there at the, um, at the La Frontera Center. And I recommended her for that position. Now, the odd thing about La Frontera, they'd had a change in leadership there, and they had kind of lost their way, I believe, to some degree. Okay? Um, that happens. You grow and sometimes you lose your you lose your kind of heart and soul. Still a great organization, great people, but um, when the founder left, who's, I said, again, whose name I can't remember, which I'm so sorry, um, something got lost. And there was a co-director there um, that, um, let's just say he had his own vision of things and we butted heads. He took offense to the fact that I made a recommendation for Dr. Gray to take over the position and decide he was going to do a national search to find the best person possible. Okay, When I knew the best person possible was right in that building and it was Dr. Norman Gray. So he did his national search and got resumes and interviews from all over the place. Um, and Norma did her interview and Norma was hired. Okay, And I think that caused some kind of resentment um, because the idea was that if I was going to leave I needed to let go and not continue to try to control things. I wasn't trying to control things. I was trying to ensure high quality and integrity services and that was Norma Gray. The problem though is that, which I understand, the process was really disappointing and disheartening to her. It shouldn't have happened. She was clearly the best and she should have been brought in right away. And unfair to her it really took away what should have been a really wonderful moment for her she took the position but it was tainted from the beginning um, and I, I know she stayed for a while and I know the circumstances her leaving but it was unfortunate that she wasn't treated um, the way she should have been um, but still she was the one that took over when I left and I felt that La Frontera and Marana were in good hands and that allowed me to move to Phoenix and take on the Department of Juvenile Corrections, um, which ended up being a major challenge. But again, I already had some plans um, about who I was going to bring with me and how I was going to do it. Latinos creciendo, energía positiva, felicidad y amor constante, pasión desmedida. Before moving forward, there is a question in my head that I would like to address. What was the role of this woman called Nelba Chavez? I, I think that's an important question because when people open doors or, or have influence, they should be acknowledged. Um, Nelba Chavez was the founder of the La Frontera Center in Tucson. Um, she started the center on community donations and worked out of two double wide trailers. 
um, and grew that organization to being the largest community mental health center in the state of Arizona. Um, she was originally, initially um, also eventually acknowledged um, by the Clinton administration for her work and actually joined uh, their team in a capacity of looking at mental health issues across the country. Um, so when Nelva Chavez called me when I was still at the Ron Health Center, I had never met her, but everybody knew her by reputation. She was, she was an icon in the South uh, Phoenix community. Um, it's also why, by the way, when I looked up La Frontera Center recently, um, I was a little upset that her name wasn't there in any sorts of acknowledgments, but that's just an aside. Um, but given the, the role she played, um, her presence should always be prominently um, noted, even in today's, today's times. So when she invited me to La Frontera, um, I was thinking I would have the opportunity to talk with somebody that could mentor me into community mental health because I was relatively new and running these small clinics in Morana and Catalina. Um, so when she actually offered me the position to become clinical director and director of training, um, it, was, uh, it was for me, it was a really great acknowledgement and honor to be, um, I, I guess, noted by someone like her. Um, and for her to be willing to turn over the directorship of the clinic she founded to me, that was really quite an honor. Um, which I eventually took, obviously. Um, so I think her role in influencing community mental health throughout Arizona and then having a chance to influence um, policies nationally really speaks to the importance of being willing to hear people who are wiser, who have walked the path before you, um, and then trying to add on to that to the best of your ability. Let's talk a little bit more about that time when you went into the Department of Juvenile Correction working for the governor's office. Well, I think that's a kind of a matter of making sure that you are careful what you ask for. Um, um, I had been to, I mentioned the, the state legislator's office and was highly critical of the Department of Juvenile Corrections the juvenile justice system. Um, so I can only imagine that when the state of Arizona got sued um, as a result of um, poor and, and abusive practices to the children that were um, actually um, committed to them, that when the new director came in, who was John Arredondo, and his assistant director, Dave Kokoris, from uh, the uh, Texas Youth Authority in, in Texas, um, I imagine that they must have gotten my name from somebody in the legislature because I didn't know either one of them. So they were the ones that called me and asked me if I'd be willing to come up to uh, Phoenix and work on the um, lawsuit to get Arizona out from under federal, uh, what they called consent decree, which is federal oversight. Um, so during that time, the state of Arizona's Department of Juvenile Corrections um, was being overseen by the federal courts to correct the problems they had in education, the mistreatment of children, and the absence of real um, treatment programs. And as a statement of their intention, um, they actually renamed the Department of Juvenile Corrections the Department of Youth Treatment and Rehabilitation. So it was consistent with the mission of uh, an agency working with uh, young boys and girls who came, uh, got in trouble with the law. What happened during those five years that you were working in the Department of uh, Juvenile Correction? Well, the first thing is that Mr. Arredondo and Mr. Kokora shared with me a five-year plan. Keep in mind, I was very skeptical about the Department of Juvenile Corrections, um, but they convinced me that they had a plan that made sense. Um, my role was to develop treatment programs, specialized treatment programs, uh, for sexual conduct, for substance abuse, and for highly violent and aggressive youth. In addition to um, having uh, mental health services that were there in place for the youth that were in the three facilities actually, one in Tucson, Catalina Mountain School, uh, the Adobe Mountain School in Phoenix, and then the Black Canyon School, which at the time was the girls facility um, in Department of Juvenile Corrections. So it was a huge cultural change. Um, 
The place was very unhealthy in terms of culture. Um, the people that worked for adult um, uh, Department of Corrections were the same hiring pool from juvenile corrections. They didn't understand kids and, and, and clearly didn't put much effort for the most part overall into providing them with educational services and treatment services. So um, it was a very difficult process um, and many people needed to be relieved um, and um, it needed to change from a prison atmosphere for adults including high security and isolation and those kinds of things to a, a learning campus in that emphasized education, vocational training, um, and health and healing for kids that have been abused and, um, and harmed in the course of their lives. Um, but luckily there was a great team assembled. Um, a very important part of that, part of that team, who I don't think got enough credit, generally speaking, was a guy named Dave Dias. He was the director of security. And he was everything that you wouldn't think about as a director of security. He loved kids. He loved talking to kids. He trained his staff um, to be part of the treatment process as opposed to um, people that were almost adrenaline junkies who loved responding like SWAT teams and taking kids down on the floor. He worked with me to clear out the security unit, which was the ju juvenile version of, of um, maximum security on campus for highly violent kids. And we worked with the kids enough so that those kids stopped fighting, they stopped doing their um, problematic behaviors and got involved in the treatment process because people took an interest in them. Um, so over the five years, um, we were able to change the entire culture of that organization so that it met its state mandate, which was to provide rehabilitation and educational services for, for youth to get them back on track in life. So it was a very hard process and it was a lot of um, infighting, a lot of subversion, um, people that were undermining the process. Um, probably 50% of the clinical staff um, were fired or terminated um, because they either didn't comply or didn't understand what we were trying to, trying to accomplish. And uh, I imagine the same was true probably for security in some of the other areas. But once we got rid of the people that were bad influences, the people that were there, there were good people there, but they just weren't allowed to do the job the way they wanted to. Those people started flourishing and that's when things really started to change. But it was a, it was a difficult, long fight. Um, with people that were entrenched um, who purposely tried to undermine what uh, Mr. Adondo and Mr. Kokoris, myself, um, and um, uh, Mr. Wright, who was head of education, were trying to accomplish. But eventually we got it taken care of. And I'm very proud of the fact that we got out from under the consent decree. They reviewed it. They looked at what we were doing in Arizona as a national model for others to copy. And at that point, um, it was it was good to have done something good in a system that was very poisoned. What happened after that? Well, the next step was another one of those unanticipated opportunities. Um, because once the youth left these secure facilities, they had to go back to the communities and needed services. So part of my job was to make sure there were um, people out in the community that could work with kids effectively in the, with their various problems of substance abuse, sexual behavior, and, um, and, high, and, and aggression. So as a result, I was overseeing contracts for people in the community that would continue to see our kids when they were discharged. As part of that, um, it was another problem of dismantling a, a corrupt and ineffective system. Um, there was a lot of uh, in, uh, old boys network in terms of contracts being awarded to people that weren't doing good jobs. And new providers that were really good had difficulty getting contracts because nobody knew them and they were small. So one of the things I did is once the contract period came up for renewal, um, the, the year I, first year I was there, um, I told them all, all contracts were terminated and it would be an open bidding process and history would, would not matter. They were given conditions in terms of treatment protocols of effective treatment for uh, specialized youth um, in these three areas of sexual behavior, substance abuse, and violence. And if they could meet those criteria with practices that were deemed professional, whether you never worked with the uh, Department of Juvenile Corrections or, or worked with them forever, you would get contracts. Um, and they were limited. Instead of a whole bunch of contracts awarded kind of randomly, where people never got any kids referred to them, I limited the number of contracts by regions in the state so that there were one primary provider in each area to provide services for kids. So that if you got a contract, you were going to see kids. 
Well, I was doing a public, I guess, hearing on this in uh, Casa Grande, where all the providers were there listening. Unbeknownst to me, there was a gentleman in the audience, audience named Jim Heinemann. Um, now, Jim Heinemann is somebody that probably nobody knows, but everybody knows of. Um, he was a former reform school kid um, back in the day um, who got this idea that people would bring their cars in for oil changes if you could do it really quickly. And he opened up a little shop that he called Jiffy Lube, okay, which <laughs> franchised and went national and he became a millionaire. Okay? He never forgot his background, so he took his millions of dollars, founded a company called U Services International in Owings Mill, Maryland, and opened up residential facilities for kids um, using his own money. Um, to start the facilities. He just happened to be visiting and was at the forum um, where I was discussing um, the new kind of process of providing treatment services and the expectations and unbeknownst to me he contacted Johnny Redondo and asked permission for uh, to talk to me about the possibility of employment. Um, at that time I was in the fifth year of uh, the five-year plan. I was committed to, to finishing but I did agree to attend a, uh, to join their board of directors so I could study their business. They were a for-profit agency and I had some concerns about that. Um, I had a chance to study their finances, their practices and get to know their business um, and became very, very much encouraged and inspired by what he put together in terms of this organization uh, called Youth Service International that was working with residential programs primarily in the East Coast at that point, Baltimore, um, Maryland, um, but also in the Midwest, Iowa, South Dakota, Missouri. Um, they had about six programs at that time and looking for expand. Once um, the consent decree was listed in Arizona and I was completed my work, um, I consulted with um, uh, Mr. Adano and, Car and Kokoris. They said um, at that point, um, um, or actually at that point, they had left and there was a new director. Um, but they were satisfied. We were out of the consent decree. Um, they um, encouraged me and um, in good faith to go ahead and pursue this new position. So after a year of studying New Service International and their business practices, I left the Department of Juvenile Corrections and took the position as National Clinical Director for Youth Services International that was based in Owings Mill, Maryland at that time. Youth Service International, a big door being open for you at that time. Can you please share with us how YSI, Youth Services International, affected your career from that point on? It's not often and routine to be in a position where you can affect the standard of practice in your area of business. Um, Youth Service International, with the support of Jim Hyman, um, really pushing and really encouraging us to strive for excellence, um, put, us, put me in a position where I could supervise and oversee increasing numbers of programs across the country um, and in some places outside the country. Um, we started with approximately six programs, again in Maryland um, um, and I think Iowa, South Dakota, Missouri, and eventually grew and acquired programs so that we were the largest provider of, of residential treatment services um, in the United States. Um, and at one point um, had at least 36 different residential programs from coast to coast. Um, it gave me a chance to really push the limits of excellence in terms of what children need. Um, and in some cases, um, um, because it was competitive, because it's a, um, a competitive bid um, every two or three years or so, um, put us in a position of being able to push other competitors to raise their standards um, in order to compete with us. Um, and I was um, excited to be able to do that. Um, even if we didn't win contracts, the other competitors had to raise their standards to be able to win contracts from us, and I was okay with that. 
Um, so as we continue to grow, um, I got a chance to travel across the country speaking to um, various state agencies and conferences about the needs of, of delinquent youth across the country. Um, got a chance to speak um, in foreign countries. Um, I got a chance to speak to the parliament in, in Ireland. I got a chance to travel to um, the, uh, I guess, the uh, Cook Islands and, and the F uh, University of Fiji. I lectured at the University of Mexico um, about and traveled to, in, to review facilities for kids um, and had a real chance to help people understand um, that what these kids needed was guidance, education, and hope. Um, and just locking them up and not providing those kinds of services uh, was not going to do any good other than breaking their spirits and creating a, a cycle of failure. Um, so Youth Service International really gave me a voice um, to be able to speak nationally um, and, and eventually um, be able to speak at, um, um, at, at the federal level to train the, um, the administration for human resources. Um, which is the basic the personnel department of the federal government about these practices related to domestic violence, uh, delinquent youth, uh, family violence in general. Um, and so I was traveling quite a bit, probably it was two weeks um, of each month. I was on the road either reviewing programs, training, setting up new programs and doing conferences. So it gave me a chance to really, really be able to have an impact, um, to have a voice in domestic violence and working with delinquent kids across the country. And I will always appreciate Jim Hyman and YSI for giving me that opportunity. You were for about 20 years in YSI. Looking back on those years, what are your thoughts? Mostly in, in looking back, I'm really grateful that I can still see actually the influence of the work that I've done. Um, in facilities that were no longer part of YSI but went independent. Um, people that are now working um, in organizations across the country outside of YSI which is actually no longer operational. Um, they closed their doors and was sold um, at, at some point. Um, but those facilities are still continuing to utilize some of the measures and practices and training that I provided for them. Uh, some of them don't even know that I provided those training or the material came for me. Um, and I'm okay with that. Um, the important thing is that those programs are doing the right thing by kids. So when I look back over YSI, I have a, a real personal sense of, of fulfillment, um, a real sense of, of having had an impact, an, an ongoing impact. And that's something that um, still to this day, um, I still feel very good about. Every company brings challenges and difficulties. After YSI came YDI, Youth Development Institute. What were those challenges and difficulties you had at that organization? At the time when I was contacted by the Youth Development Institute, I was still you know, working as a consultant uh, with YSI. Even though I ended my employment with them, they hired me back as a consultant to continue to kind of provide guidance, um, which I really appreciated. Um, now, the owner and director of YDI was David Kikoris, Um and he was the assistant director at the Department of Juvenile Corrections that was renamed the Department of Youth Treatment and Rehabilitation that brought me on there. So he was familiar with me, and I was familiar with him. So when he told me that he was interested in me taking the position of clinical director there um, to help them grow and expand, um, add on programming and, and increase the effectiveness of their clinical programs. Um, I knew he was someone I could work with, um, so I had no questions about that. Um, my experience there taught me the difference between wanting change and being ready to change. Um, as I said before, sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for. Um, and they were asking for change. Um, I've learned that if you want um, programs to work effectively, it has to be run systematically, systems in place, um, and not run by personalities. Um, when systems are running, you get equality and fairness. With personalities, sometimes there are compromises to standards of practice. 
So I began very meticulously doing what I do, putting systems in place so that decisions about progress, decisions about needs can be made objectively um, on a case-by-case basis. Um, YDI was a, um, a facility where personalities ran heavy in terms of making decisions. And I think that that caused some problems. Um, I was told that I was creating, quote, shifts in tectonic plates. Um, and I thought this is good because shifting and change is what I was hired to do. But um, because uh, of the personalities involved, um, um, it placed the director, David Corris, in a very difficult position. Um, and he and I mutually agreed um, toward the end of my tenure there, after there had been changes made um, that I was very proud of, in, improved clinical training, improved improve clinical efficiency. Um, but as I said, decisions were being taken out of the hands of people and placed in systemic measures of progress. And that takes power away from individuals that are used to having power and to make decisions on the fly. Um, I learned decisions on the fly that are made out of personal um, in, in, from, from in, individuals um, often don't reflect the needs of the circumstance and can create loyalties rather than professional practices. So um, under the circumstances it was agreed upon after I, I believe about uh, two or three years there that it was time for me to go and that we mutually agreed upon that. Um, I have no regrets about my time there. I met some wonderful people there, some of whom um, I continue, uh, some of whom uh, I uh, admired, a couple of whom I hired in my kind of future clinical work. Um, but it was a difficult thing because for me to leave that situation, I had to leave somebody that I thought was a personal friend and Dave Kokoris, and that's the only regret that I have, that necessarily for reasons he and I know and no one else needs to know, um, our relationship needed to come to an end. Um, and so since the day I walked out of that building, I have not spoken to him, uh, talked to him, uh, not out of animosity. Um, it was a friendship that needed to end under the circumstances. Um, and he knows what the circumstances are. Um, and he, I think he felt equally conflicted, but we both felt it was the right thing to do. So it was time for me to move on and I left. Latinos creciendo, energía positiva, felicidad y amor constante. Through the whole interview, you have been sharing with us how important, without mentioning, stability is for you as a professional. Do you consider YDI a failure in your career? When I look back on YDI, um, I don't consider it a failure. I consider it a lesson learned. Um, the lesson is one that I knew before but remind, was reminded of and that I continue to value today. Um, stability is important, but we can't confuse stability with stagnancy. Um, stability is so we can continue to build, evolve, and change. Um, when people or programs get used to and hold on to doing things simply because it's the way it's always been done, that's not stability, that's stagnancy. And stagnancy is just one step towards death, one step toward a business closing, one step towards a person um, not continuing their evolution and development. Um, so I recognize the difference between stability and stagnancy. And I create st stability so I can build and create additional changes. But I, I, I don't uh, accept stagnancy um, where people are resigned to doing things a certain way because that's the way they've always done it. So, no, I, I, I there's a lot of good things I learned about YDI that I put into practice in later later years. A lot of good people I met, as I said, some of whom I still in touch with. Um, and so it was a good it was a good period for me. And I enjoyed working with my friend David Corris. But I don't see it as a failure, but it was a lesson learned. When one door closes, another door opens. And this is a big one. So after this last company, you had the chance to star over. We need to talk about Dr. Brad Bayless, the owner, the founder of Bayless and Associates, your new company from that time on. The first thing is that uh, I use the word respect very carefully. 
and I use the word admiration even more carefully. Um, Dr. Brad Bayless was someone who I respected and admired. Now I knew him long before I joined um, what was Bayless Associates and now is known as Bayless Integrated Healthcare. Um, being two of what seemed to be the only black psychologists in the state of Arizona, um, it's, our, our paths didn't cross but we knew of each other. We'd each um, created a name for ourselves. Um, for Dr. Bayless, he was very well known in the forensic circles. Uh, my sister's an attorney and um, she knew of him. Um, he was um, highly respected um, as a forensic psychologist and clinical psychologist. And an individual who had the business savvy, which most psychologists and, and behavioral professionals don't have, to really start his own organization, Bayless and Associates. Um, so at that time, um, I was still traveling you know, across the country most of the time on the road. But I always made a point of trying to reconnect with, with Brad. Um, we would sit and talk for hours about, you know, who knows what. Um, being black psychologist in Arizona was, was, not, a, was not an easy thing. Um, there's a strong good old boys network and neither one of us were really any of the good old boys, okay. Um, so he, uh, we kept each other grounded, I think. Um, although we are almost opposites in personality, in terms of principles, practice, and ethics, I found a real brother in him. Um, he was, you know, um, brash and, and loud and uh, bigger than life, um, and I, I admired that. Um, I was more reserved and calculated, and he admired that. We, we learned from each other. Um, you know, he was, he, he taught me to be a little bolder, um, a little more outspoken, um, and I taught him to probably a lesser degree to exercise some reserve on occasion. Um, but we met, you know, every year or so for I don't know how long. We used to, we, we could never figure out exactly where we met each other. That was always, that always came up every time we met, exactly when we knew each other. But he told stories about his kids, his family. Uh, I told him some stories about my travels. Um, and so when I left YDI, uh, less than a week after I left, he, he called me just randomly and asked me if I was in town. We could get together and maybe meet and talk and catch up. Um, and so when I met with him, that's when he found out that officially I wasn't working. And my original plan was to take a year off. Uh, to think about what I wanted to do, um, and then he told me he had a he had this quote project, okay, um, and he had this look in his eye. You, you had to know him. He, he you know he he was so expressive. He had this look in his eye like a kid who just robbed the candy store. Um, he told me he had this project he wanted to talk to me about. So he told me that um, Bayless and Associates was going to be opening up a clinic in South Phoenix, and would I be interested? Knowing full well that I would be interested because it's located in South Phoenix, a highly distressed area where juvenile uh, delinquency and, and uh, crime was, was, was you know, um, disproportionately high, which he knew those are the kind of things that always caught my attention and intrigued, and intrigued me. So I told him that I would agree to be the clinical director of the clinic at South Phoenix if he moved the adolescent program, which was at that time at their main clinic on 3rd Street, from the main clinic to, to South Phoenix, and that I would run the adolescent program, um, which obviously <laughs> he agreed and wanted me to do. So that was opening up the new door um, to um, Bayless Associates that's gone through a number of iterations um, to the current powerhouse that it is today. Um, but that was the opening, just a conversation with a friend who I'd known for years, um, where time and opportunity seemed to have crossed um, in a way that was just at the right moment. A right phone call at the right moment um, with a friend um, and somebody that we'd always joked and, 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 and plotted to work together, but our paths just never really crossed until that day um, at the restaurant eating lunch. Um, when I was thinking, uh, maybe I would retire. <laughs> As I mentioned, now you are in Bayless Integrated Healthcare. What did you receive with this opportunity? Beyond the opportunity to work with Brad as a, as a friend that 
I had known for years, um, was the opportunity to um, help establish a, a, a new clinic um, and to be able to build it literally from the ground up. It was a building that was redesigned, an old restaurant that was redesigned for a clinic. Um, there were no staff. Um, a gentleman named Mark Coakley was the operation director. He and I were the two people that started um, the South Phoenix Family Clinic. And the opportunity to build a culture, he and I spoke about that at length. We wanted the building to feel a certain way. We wanted people in there to feel and be a certain way. It wasn't just programming. It was an atmosphere of excellence um, uh, that we wanted to create there. Um, and we decided right away, we, were going, we weren't going to accept the idea that people had to respect each other, they didn't have to like each other. Um, we created a culture that people not only liked each other, but loved each other. Loved coming to work, loved working together, and were highly effective um, as professionals. Um, so having an entire clinic, you know, that, that bought into that, we met with people beginning with weeks before the clinic opened, interviewed them, uh, picked people that were coming down to the South Clinic, um, had meetings with them about the atmosphere and what we were expecting before any before the doors even opened. Um, so it allowed us to allowed me to really be part of building something from the ground up. Before it was always you know fixing things that were broken. Um, now I had an opportunity to take what I learned from you know my work with Marana La Frontera, um, my discussion with Nelva Chavez. Um, my work with the Department of Juvenile Corrections with high-risk uh, youth and domestic violence to take what I learned about the tens of thousands of families and kids that I worked with across the country, across cultures, across regions, across races. There were certain things that were common that had to do with success and failure and being able to finally take all that 30-plus um, years of experience of what worked and didn't work and to start fresh with no expectations other than what worked, and to hand pick the people um, that would be involved in that in that process, um, and so that was really exciting. And as the, the South Clinic grew um, and became um, vital and alive and busy, it provided other opportunities uh, for me in uh, Bayless, and including being the clinical director of the organization. Um, but you know, for me, um, it wasn't a good fit. Um, and I ended up moving back to South Clinic um, to be back at my home clinic um, so I could oversee the teen program, which is really what I wanted to do. Um, I wasn't looking to make a mark or make changes. I'd done that with YSI. I wanted to start something fresh and new. Um, and that was the opportunity to create particularly the teen program uh, that became the Lighthouse Project based on what I knew would work from over two decades of work with tens of thousands of families and kids across the country. Um, it was really exciting to be able to start at square one with people at square one and to start fresh and new. Latinos creciendo, energía positiva, felicidad y amor constante, pasión desmedida. The words are all out there. And it's almost impossible to be in this community without listening the people talking about the Lighthouse program and the impact that this one is having in the community. Can you please talk to us more about that? Uh, yes, and first we refer to ourselves as a Lighthouse project as opposed to program. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, we don't program people's minds and tell them what to think. Um, we build futures for kids and families that are struggling, um, and that's a project. So we refer to ourselves as the Lighthouse Project. We're building futures for kids. Um, we're really proud of the fact that um, our, our name is out there. We've done no marketing. We've done no advertising. Um, recently, there was a um, video placed on the Bayless website um, page, and. Um, interviews with me and my staff and some of the parents and kids and that's been recent. But other than that it's been word of mouth um, that our biggest advocates are the kids and families that have come into our program. Um, we have kids that recruit other kids into our program. Um, we have parents recruiting other families into our program. So we're very proud of the fact that we've grown from a basically a 
a, a group of kids that used to meet at Third Street um, and, and talk about things that weren't that relevant, to be honest with you, uh, maybe 12 kids, to a currently pushing 200 kids. We're now in group therapy, group sessions of um, family sessions, um, doing vocational training, but getting to serious, serious questions that face teenagers today that have to do with things relevant to their success, uh, their confidence in themselves and their fears and anxieties about the future. Um, so we're, we're very proud of that, that we uh, tell our, our youth that we are not here to tell you what to do. Um, we're here to show you what you're doing so you can take a look at your life and make a decision about changes that you want to make. Um, the majority of our kids uh, come in initially not of their own volition. They're referred by the courts, they're referred by the uh, Department of uh, Child Safety, they're, re they're referred by parents who um, you know, insist their kids come and they don't want to. But we're able to have meaningful conversations with them to the point where many of the kids, it's fairly routine that when they turn 18, they continue to voluntarily come. Um, and participate in the program because they find relationships and discussions that are meaningful um, to their circumstances, challenges, things they've had to overcome from the past and their fears and anxieties about the future. Um, so we provide the youth of the Lighthouse Project with an opportunity to really understand um, things in life that have occurred to them that were confusing, harmful, hurtful, um, traumatic, um, and to build confidence in their ability to overcome those things and to walk into the future with a sense of hope that um, their best days are, are ahead of them. Um, and I'm very proud of the fact that um, I have staff members who have been with me. One, Jennifer Woodson, been with me from the beginning. She was hand-selected from 3rd Street, was about to resign and quit because she knew that the program, as it was then, um, was not really up to where it should have been. Um, I'm glad I convinced her to stay. She's been my right hand uh, with me the whole period, of, the whole time, as we evolved and grew um, this Lighthouse Project into a force that is impacting some of the highest risk, most challenged and difficult families in the Valley. Um, we have people coming to us uh, to the South Phoenix Clinic all over the Valley, all over the, the you know broader state of Arizona more recently. Um, and we're proud that they're learning to work together uh, cohesively to try to collectively to make sense of their lives. We see ourselves as a 200 uh, kid family um, with now 10 staff members um, full time um, working with them to help them put the pieces of their lives together and build something new and inspiring. Sometime last year, I saw a TV show with one interview somebody was conducting with you, and you were talking about the levels of stress on the kids and the youth. Most of the adults seem not to understand this, and you understand it very well. So it's a big surprise for me that you have more than... 200 kids in this project with a big waiting list. So how do you do to handle the levels of stress in these patients, so to speak? Uh, I, I remember the, the interview with one of the local news stations and they were surprised when I said that the most recent research showed that uh, teenage youth actually had higher levels of stress than adults. Um, and adults will say, well, you know, what do the kids have to worry about? I have, you know, a job and family, I have to support them and all these sorts of things. Um, and I'll say, well, but see, that's where you don't understand teenagers. Um, that you have a job and you've had jobs. You've interviewed for jobs, you've lost jobs, got new jobs. Teenagers are just entering the job market at one of the most competitive times in history in terms of breaking into the job market. It's their first job. Um, they are just now beginning to see the responsibilities of adulthood and adjusting to that. Um, education levels, job competition requirements are higher now than ever. And you have teenage kids that are looking for their first jobs, their first interviews. They're managing their first real significant relationships beyond teenage dating and, and kind of youthful socializing. They're first timers in approaching life um, and often don't have mentors, don't have um, successful role models. 
Um, so yes, um, their stress level is higher. It doesn't mean that they're doing more. It doesn't mean that they have more responsibilities. It means that they are new to having these responsibilities um, and they are very stressed about it. Um, and it's important to recognize that rather than to dismiss it as saying, well, they're just kids, what do they have to worry about? They have their entire futures to worry about. And one of the things I've learned in, in working and talking with these teenage boys and girls is in spite of what they may say and in spite of what people may believe, their future is on their minds and they care deeply. They're worried and anxious um, about being successful um, and they simply just sometimes don't know how to speak about it, don't know who to talk to about it, and we provide them with those opportunities. I am pretty sure your answer to this question is going to be no, but I know myself and I think this is one of your legacies, the Lighthouse Project. Do you consider this project your legacy? Well, probably, as you mentioned, my, my first inclination is to say no, okay? Um, in terms of how most people view legacies, meaning, you know, their name attached to accomplishments and things of that nature. Um, but if I look broader than that um, and choose to look at it a different way, and that means having an ongoing substantial impact that's relevant, then I could say the Lighthouse Project, among other things, uh, my work with YSI, my work in the area of forensics and domestic violence, are part of a legacy I'm proud of. And in fact, um, I've challenged my own staff to recognize the importance of the Lighthouse Project and clinical work in general by telling them, you need to understand that there are very few professions that truly save lives. And Ours is one of them, prevention of family violence, juvenile violence, and crime. But here's what I tell them you also need to appreciate. By changing how this particular young girl or young boy views relationships, you'll change the friendships that they have. You'll change the families that they have in the future. You'll change the kids that they raise. You'll change the the life of the kids that they raise, you'll change the families of the kids that they raise, you will have an impact that will endure throughout time. If you can just help this young boy and young girl see life in a different way. So in that sense, if you're talking about a legacy as far as having an enduring impact, um, yes. Um, not because my name is attached to it, but because I've made a difference and those that work with me have made a difference that will literally endure across time with each family that changes because we provided a healthier way of being in relationships, a healthier way of living, and a respect and a true love for um, people that they build future relationships with. And I'm proud of that and it's, I'm proud of my team for being part of that. I cannot stop thinking about the life you have been saving because it's life saving through the Lighthouse Project and through the forensic cases you attend. We are going next to the forensics. And I am sure you have great experiences to share with us. My work in forensics was not really part of a, a plan. Um, it's something that evolved out of my work with um, families where there was abuse and, um, and ab abusive parents. Um, as a result, um, I did more and more work um, in the area of domestic violence. Um, learning, studying, working with these families, and doing presentations on domestic violence. Um, as a result of the, the attention I received doing public lectures on domestic violence, um, I was contacted by an attorney um, in a specific homicide case. Um, um, it was a self-defense case. Um, and it was unusual, you know, in that um, my very first time going to court, 
um, was in a homicide case um, for a woman who was being um, defended um, by her attorney who from a very abusive husband. So that led me to be more and more involved um, doing expert testimony on people who were primarily women who were being attacked and, and defended themselves sometimes sometimes using lethal force and then doing trainings with attorneys on family and domestic violence as well. So my, my move into forensics um, was directly a result of clinical work I was doing with families and um, children who were in, and wives who were in violent situations and then it led over to expert testimony in court. Does your forensic work also include men? My forensic work didn't include men at first. It started with women who were defending themselves um, and trying to um, convince juries that they, they did not start or initiate the violence. But my work with teenagers and violent families led me to starting to work with men who face criminal charges. Um, and these were men who as children grew up in violent homes, um, abusive homes, and the goal was to try to explain the things that influence these men um, who were grown up um, um, as children that led them down a path of violence. So the work with men in forensics actually came later um, as I continued to work with teenagers and, and families who were, who were violent and abusive. How do you decide which cases are you going to work in? Well, one of the advantages of, you know, my having been uh, successful in my career um, is I can pick and choose my cases. Um, and the forensic work I do, I do more on the side. Um, and because of that, I talk to the attorneys ahead of time about the nature of the case, the details of the case, and I can pick the cases that I really believe in. I can look at cases where it's clear that women were defending themselves, that their life was in danger and they were defending themselves, and they had no choice. They, they didn't want to hurt their partners. They certainly didn't want to kill them in a situation where that occurred, but they were desperate to, to save their own lives. So I, I pick those cases very carefully. When it comes to men, um, again, I, I pick cases where it's really clear that this, this particular individual had an extremely, extremely violent background. Um, in their cases, it doesn't excuse the crime. I'm not looking for, and the attorneys aren't looking for them to be uh, found innocent. They're just looking for what they call, quote, mitigating factors that when they get sentenced, um, and will in most cases do time, they'll get a more lenient and shorter period of time um, because of the circumstances that they grew up in that really um, could have predicted they went down that road. Um, so it's for me, I, I really, it, it's very important to me to have a, a sense of conscience and ethics about the cases I take. Um, I turn down most of the cases that are given to me because when I examine the cases, um, I don't, I'm not compelled, um, I, I'm not convinced um, that um, I can really take on this case and really believe um, that I'm on the right side of justice. So because I don't make them, because the majority of the, my earning, my salary does not come from forensic cases, I have no problem with turning them down. Um, and that's what I do if I don't actually believe in the case. What kind of cases are we talking about here? All of the cases would have included violent crimes um, or violent actions, I should say. Um, in the case of women who were defending themselves, it can include um, using lethal force, um, meaning in, in a couple cases, unfortunately, their, their um, partners died um, in the course of them defending themselves. Um, and same thing in the, in the case of working with men, um, that these are violent crimes where either people were killed or could have been killed given the seriousness of the, of the crime. So they're typically um, assault cases, aggravated assault, meaning with weapons, um, although, and, and then first degree uh, murder, which is basically premeditated. Um, and then beyond that, some of them are, what are considered capital cases, meaning that the crime was serious enough and it was premeditated in the, in the eyes of the prosecutors that the death penalty is an option should the person be found guilty. Is there any particular case that stands out to you in terms of justice being served? 
Yes, there, there are a number of cases, but in terms of justice being served, meaning someone innocent of the crime they were being convicted of, that makes it a bit different. Some of the people, they committed crimes and they in fact were guilty, but there were circumstances beyond that. But one of the cases that jumps out the most, which is probably why I continued in forensics, was my very first case. Um, this was a young woman who was married and um, extremely abusive husband, um, extremely abusive. Um, and she was in a circumstance where um, she was frightened, scared, and it's absolutely clear, looking at the circumstances, not just from what she said, from witnesses, it's absolutely clear that had she not defended herself, um, which ended up taking his life, he would have killed her, probably her two kids and her sister, um, because they were in front of the house and he basically said um, that that's what he was going to do. Okay. Um, she was not a criminal. She had no criminal history whatsoever. Uh, a kind, you know, really gentle woman, worked with kids, I believe was a school teacher. Um, uh, I, no, actually she worked in, uh, as an assistant in a treatment facility, now that I think about it. Um, and, it's, and she was devastated um, when she discovered that her husband had actually died. She was devastated emotionally. Um, and once the story came out, and I was able to tell the entire story of what happened, um, and the jury said, you know, basically not guilty, and, and she went home to her kids, my first thought was, that's justice. That is justice. And, and now that I think about it, I think that case is what really made me continue to work in the area of forensics. Um, I felt very, very much so that justice had been served in that case. Dr. McCain, I had the chance to be in two or three presentations of you in the past. And for me, that's a complete experience. So have you continued to do public speaking? And have you changed anything in your style? Well, what's interesting, you use the term experience because that's the part that's different. Um, in my early training lectures back at La Frontera Mental Health Center, I was doing training lectures on information and clinical work and diagnostics. And, um, but one thing I learned in forensics, when you're talking to people where there's a jury, you have to tell a story that's compelling. They can't just hear information, they have to feel the truth. So one of the things that I ended up doing is I started doing back doing the public lectures again. Um, is I wanted to make it an experience. So as you saw, I use music, um, I use slides, I, I use pictures, photos, um, so that people have an experience of what I'm doing that's meant not just to provide information, but to give them a feel for what I'm talking about. Um, so yes, um, now when I'm doing presentations, uh, the information is still there, but I want to provide the information in the context of human experience of what I'm talking about. Um, and that's, that's changed as a direct result of um, the work I was doing in forensics. Latinos creciendo, energía positiva, felicidad y amor constante. I honestly believe that you are a storyteller, not only in your public speaking, but in the forensic cases. How do you feel about that? Well, basically, for me, the best way to convey um, the truth is through stories. Um, information by it, it itself is dry, it's not interesting, and eventually, people forget. It's like taking a test in college. You, you take the test, you studied, and then you take, after you take the test, you forget, you don't remember. But people remember stories. It's why there's mythology, uh, fairy tales, fables. Um, important points are conveyed through stories. So if you really want somebody to understand your point, don't just give them information. Tell them a story about it because people will remember the story long after they've forgotten specific information. So I, I do see myself as a storyteller um, because that's the best way to convey the truth. 
I really want to talk about you as an author. Moments of Truth is the name of your book. What should we know about your book? The first thing uh, to know about the book is it wasn't intended to be a book. Um, I wanted to think uh, about the years and years of practice that I had and what I learned. And what I realized um, is something that I've uh, said for years. Um, and that is everything that I know, I learned from someone else. Um, when it came to my clinical practice, I realized there were a lot of stories that people had told me um, in the course of working with them um, that revealed some truths that were surprising to them, sometimes shocking but also reveal the truth about the human experience. And Moments of Truth basically is about people who discovered what they currently believe would no longer work for them. And the moment of truth is that they had to uh, come to a reckoning that something new had to be understood or discovered for them to move forward. Um, so a moment of truth is when you realize you cannot continue to go on the way you have. Um, it's a moment of truth about the need for change and the need for recon recognizing that something is not working. Um, so these were individuals that had stories inside of themselves um, about their past, um, about why things happen and why they did things that left them stuck. Stuck in a moment because they could not get to the truth based on what they believe presently. So the book, what turned into a book, was really a collection of reflections on people I've worked with and those moments where they discovered what I am believing is not working for me anymore and I have to discover actually what the truth is. The book is available on Amazon. Um, it's, it's called um, Moments of Truth. Um, and it's by uh, Dr. John McCain. There are other titles that are similar, so it's important to uh, make sure you have the title and the name. Um, and it's also subtitled, Moments of Truth, Restorations of Selfhood. Um, it's the idea being that people have been damaged, hurt um, over the course of their lives, and um, by working with them and creating um, a, a new story, a truthful story, it restores their sense of self and allows them to move forward in life in a healthier and more hopeful way. Um, also, um, uh, I am completing um, a, a second edition. I'm, I'm hopeful it will be done in January of, of next year. Um, that includes some revisions, changes, corrections in the first one, but also some additional stories and some additional observations, um, particularly given what's been going on over the past year or so um, in terms of struggles that we had uh, socially. So it's expanded beyond just observations about clinical work to observations about society in general. Um, and I do believe that at present we are in a moment of truth. Um, as a society, uh, as a nation, and, and, and perhaps even the world, where we cannot continue to move forward the way we have been moving and expect things to be successful, peaceful, and har harmonious. I do believe that we're in a moment of truth where things are going to need to change for us to move forward. Can you please share with us what is your biggest learning in these 40 years of experience? Um, the basic learning includes um, probably two parts to it. Um, we have these huge diagnostic manuals and lists of mental disorders and, um, and that's all well and good. But I, I think in some ways I can boil down every situation I've worked with into two basic challenges. And sometimes people struggle with both. One, the threat of a situation or person in our lives that we're not sure we can live with that leaves us in a state of fear. Two, the absence of something or someone from our lives that leaves us in a state of pain and emptiness, uh, that leaves us in a state of, of hurt and darkness. Some people um, struggle with both. 
I'm thinking of a young man I work with in Florida when I said this. You know, it's the presence of something or someone you can't live with, or the absence of something or someone you can't live without. And this 15-year-old boy looked at me and said, I think it can be both. And I asked him to explain. He said, I, I love my dad. His father was horribly abusive. He said, I love my dad. I, I can't live with him. Uh, it, it, he, he scares me so. Uh, I, I can't imagine living with him anymore. And then he teared up and he said, but, but I love my dad. And I can't imagine life without him. So I, I can't imagine living with him because he scares me and he hurts me. And I can't imagine living without him because he's my dad. And I think that was a real truth that he wrestled with the whole time we worked with him. So I, I believe those are uh, the simple learning is that we struggle with some basic simple things as human beings. We have things in our lives we don't know what to do about and we have things missing from our lives that we don't know how to get back. And those are my basic learning. We struggle with fear and pain. And everything else is really just details. Any advice for the people that is listening to us today? Uh, maybe uh, a thought or something to consider um, as opposed to advice. Uh, we all have a story. Um, and much of my work, as I said, was getting people to the honest truth of their story. They've been experiencing and even told things that remove them from the truth. And when you're removed from the truth, you will have a moment of truth where the truth will need to be seen and discovered. So I would encourage this. Given the fact that the truth is in the stories, every one of us should consider the possibility that the best book you will ever read will be your own biography. Write a book about your life. Reflect back honestly on what you've learned, what you've struggled with, your successes, your failures. The best book that you will ever read will be your own honest biography, and I would encourage people to write it. Does it mean we can count on reading your biography in the future? Well, you will receive the second edition of Moments of Truth. Um, whether, although everyone should write a biography, I guess it's each person's choice about whether they choose to publish it. In very few words, how do you describe your path to success? Find your passion, because what you're passionate about will stay with you your entire life. Not fads, not convenient things of the moment, not other people's ideas about what you should do with your life. Find your passion um, and attach your commitment, your conviction, your energy to pursuing that path in life. Also, remember the African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So it also means that your path in life Um, and the path to success is inclusive of those that you can learn from. Those who have been maybe a bit further down the road than, than, than you. And rely upon them for wisdom and for experience, but not depending on them to chart your own course. So it's important that you, each one of us, and I, I believe this is what I try to do, to chart my own course in life, but to be Um, aware and respectful of those who have something to offer that can assist me in finding my path. But it's my path. And though I solicit help and, and, and appreciate support, ultimately, it's my journey and my path to follow. Um, and that's what I would encourage everyone to do. Find your journey without distraction. Accept help and support and appreciate those that do. 
but recognize that your past is uniquely yours um, to whatever success you're looking for. And the pursuit of it is something that um, should demand your attention, your conviction, um, and your ongoing sense of focus. Just talking to you, receiving a piece of your clarity, your wisdom, and your balance is rewarding to me. So I want to say thank you so much for giving us the opportunity of this interview. And I am pretty sure everybody is going to enjoy Dr. McCain's path to success. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the privilege and honor of being able to participate um, on your show. And I'm just hopeful that uh, there was something in the, my story uh, that will allow people to think on their own pathway to success and assist them in getting there. So thank you very much. Latinos creciendo.